Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We are starting with the afternoon session um, on um, the other eye. Um, the title is Ethics, Philosophy, and Spirituality. Um, we are going to divide uh, the speaker's sessions and questions and answers in two slots. So um, after the first two, We'll have a, a, a slot for, for questions and um, at the end, of course. Um, I hope uh, that your glycemical index is still high so that you will not fall asleep after the lunch. And um, um, by not losing uh, important uh, time, I will introduce the uh, first speaker which is Joanna Bryson from the United States. Uh, I'll read a short uh, intro. Joanna J. Bryson is a transdisciplinary researcher on the structure and dynamics of human and animal-like intelligence. Her research covering topics from artificial intelligence through autonomy and robot ethics and onto human cooperation has, has appeared in Venices ranging from a Reddit to science. She holds degrees in psychology from Chicago and Edinburgh and artificial intelligence from Edinburgh and MIT. She has additional professional research experience from Princeton, Oxford, Harvard and Lego and technical experience in Chicago financial industry and international management consultancy. Uh, Bryson is presently a, a, a re, um, reader, uh, associate professor at, brackets, at the University of Bath and um, an affiliate of Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy. Please, Joanna, take a place. All right. Okay. So, hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Chris Scott. Um, I, uh, I want to say, have you, can you see my title now? I can see it, but I don't know, can you see it? So uh, I apologize uh, it, I, if it looks like I'm being rude to the organizers, but I've been using this title for about a year and a half now, but I did, of course, choose it for here. But uh, 
Yeah, the, the opposite of the uh, Andre Sish, right? The, the why not to other AI? Um, and when I say other here, it's sort of a joke. In American English, uh, to other is something that you talk about uh, when you take someone and you exclude them from your in-group. But here, of course, what I mean is that we include AI as a human, and I say, let's not do that. So let's talk about that. Um, first of all, I want to point out the artificial intelligence is already here. So when people talk about this, they're, also t they're often talking about some not so distant future. They often say, oh, 40 years, 60 years, which is also about how long they think it will take to understand consciousness. So anything that's too close to us, we push it just past our own lifetimes. But actually, this stuff that you're seeing on the monitors, that really is artificial intelligence. It is machines doing things that require intelligence in nature, right? And that's all artificial intelligence is. All right, so I don't know how many people have heard of deep learning, uh, but some people think, oh my goodness, like things are really changing now. We have a, a new magic. And the new magic is going to make artificial intelligence um, so much smarter than humans that um, we won't be able to catch up, that it will know everything, it will be omniscient. And then it will become human-like, which is already a contradiction because humans are not omniscient. But anyway, learning isn't magic. No single algorithm can suddenly know everything. And I'm going to go into a few slides about this. But I think there's a confusion because people tend to think that um, artificial intelligence is a form of mathematics. Mathematics is eternal, right? Mathematics is something that, you know, that, that just is. But computation is a physical process. It's something that happens in the real world. So computation requires time to happen. It requires space for the memory. And it requires energy to happen, all right? So getting to do the right thing at the right time, and that's the most basic problem of intelligence, is a kind of search. And when you're trying to understand why search is hard, or why it's hard to be smart, um, there's a technical term for this in computer science. It's called combinatorics. All right. So this is my one-slide version, because I only had 25 minutes, and they asked me to talk about a lot of things. My one-slide version of combinatorics. Pretend you have a robot that can only do two things. It can go right or it can go left, right? So if it has only one step, it can only do two things. If it can do two steps, it now has four things it could do, right? And you can kind of see how that goes. And that may not seem that exciting, but you go from here to here in nine months. All right? That's, that's a big deal. There's more possible short chess games. I'm not talking about moving the rook back and forth. I'm talking about a move, 35 move limit. There's more possible short chess games than atoms in the universe. So no machine is going to know everything. No human is going to know everything. We can't have it all stored somewhere, right? And I can tell you that biology is a lot more complicated than chess, right? So there is no general intelligence. Humans just use and share computation more than other animals, and that's why we're winning, right? So I have no idea what that is. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, this problem of combinatorics, this problem of uh, th that, that nothing is knowable, not everything can be knowable, is part of the reason that brains look like this. So the reason that there's different colors, do you see how there's different colors? The different colors indicate different connectivity between brain cells. The different regions of the brains use different architectures to solve different problems. So they learn at different rates. Why should that be? If there was one magic algorithm, we wouldn't have to be like that. But it's because different parts are concentrating on different things. The most obvious, right, the front there is the eye, right? The eye is trying to do something very special. It's obviously completely different from the rest of the brain. It's not getting light on it, right? Only the eye is getting light on it. So that's just the most obvious uh, example. All right, so my claim here is the reason that uh, machine learning is doing such great stuff so far, or suddenly, is because we've gotten really good at uploading the search we've already done. And the name for the search we've already done, the name for all this knowledge, is basically culture. All right? So that's why we're so much smarter than the chimpanzees. Right? The other, other eye that's on our poster here. All right? That, that we're not that much smarter than chimpanzees, but we communicate a lot better. 
It's only in the last 10,000 years since we've had writing that there's been more hominids than there were macaques, right? Macaques are monkeys, not chimpanzees, but still. All right, so yeah, sorry. I don't have any macaques in my backyard, so this is... <laughs> so so the, yeah, animals can be cute, but we're the ones with the laptops because we have language, and that allows us to transmit and save more information, okay? All right, so the reason for the first half of my title, there is no AI ethics, is because AI ethics and human ethics are actually the same thing, okay? And that's because AI is not another, it's just another way that we humans process and extend that tiny fraction of knowledge that we have, okay? So, so it's just something, it's another way that we are doing discovery, it's another tool that we use, all right? And I can prove this um, because I put a paper into science, haha. -ha. Actually, I, <laughs> that's not really a proof. Science doesn't prove things, it just makes things more likely, right? But anyway. Um, so what that paper is about is meaning, also known as semantics, okay? And so the question is, how do we, what does it even mean to mean something? Well, one of the theories is the word's meaning is exactly the same as how you use it. Now, I, I know that sounds boring and reductionist, but really it's profound. <laughs> and, and I hope that you'll see that in the next few slides. So one of the things we figured out um, some years ago, and it was necessary, this is the technology that underlies uh, web search, is that we can find out um, semantics, we can figure out the meaning of a word just by counting the other words that are nearby it. So we just count four, for a small, back in the 90s when computers were small, we just took a small list of words and said, did this word, how many times did this word occur next to the word that I'm interested in? I'll, I'll give an example soon, it'll get clearer. Okay, and so then we would, keep we would keep count of that and we'd have it in something we call a vector, for those of you who've done mathematics. So, so you just keep track for 75 words, how, you know, just literally did it appear three times, seven times, right? And then um, we could use those vectors to say how close to are two words to meaning the same thing. So if they have similar neighbors, they probably mean the same things. And back in the 90s, in the old way, we would do things like, you know, we would take uh, semantics results from psychology, and we would say, uh, oh look, our, our vectors are like 70% correlated, right? We have almost the same uh, kinds of results. So that's the old way. The new way that we got into science was um, looking at a very interesting question, which was already a little different. So who here has heard of the implicit association task or implicit bias? Have you heard of implicit bias? Okay then this talk is going to be freaky for another reason besides AI, if you haven't heard of this. So, um, the implicit association task was something psychologists came up with, again in the late 1990s, that allowed us to find out that we associate certain kinds of things with different races and different genders. And the way we found out was by asking people to click on a computer. So, for example, the picture you see here, the question is, is it, are boys more mathematical and women more, in, you know, compared to each other? If you're thinking of math and you're thinking of reading, would you associate the boys with the math or the girls with the math? Or the boys with the reading or the girls with the reading? All right? So it's a complicated procedure because you're saying, well, which is easier, to match up boys in math and girls in reading or boys in reading and girls in math? Okay? And if you're asked to do that, we see how fast you can go, and we see um, by that how, it, so in the ideal world, of course, we, everybody would do math, right? And everybody would read. And so it should, t it should be no harder to do one pair than the other. But what we look at is how much harder is it to do one pair. Okay, so yeah, the associated concepts are easier to pair, and the differential reaction time, the differences in how fast you can click, it's how we measure the bias. All right. I'm sorry, this is slightly out of order, I think. Just to be clear, we're not, not for that, that's how the human data is coming. Now here's how the computer data is coming. We're not saying that artificial and intelligence mean the same thing because you see them together. We're saying that artificial, because you hear of artificial intelligence and you hear of artificial flowers, but you never hear about artificial deplorable, 
then that means that intelligence is more similar to meaning of flowers than it is to deplorable. Okay, so it's the words next to it. So that's, that's the data we're using. Okay, and nowadays, we call these things word embeddings. And as I said, this is the core technology to search engines. So guess who has made very good ones available? Uh, Google. You can, so we didn't create our own. We used the ones from Google and also some other ones from Stanford. Um, which, because we didn't want to introduce prejudice ourselves, we just said we're going to use the standard ones that are used in everybody's web tools. All right. So this is the, the gentle warm-up, so you don't have to be too worried. We're checking whether it's flowers are more pleasant and insects are more unpleasant, or if flowers are more unpleasant and insects are more pleasant. So I, I hope nobody will be offended if we, we decide that the flowers are more pleasant. And in fact, you know, for humans, it, this is, if you're a psychologist, these are huge numbers, or tiny numbers, depending on how you think about it. But this is an extremely significant result, all right, with only 32 people. So humans have a very hard time matching up insects with pleasant words and flowers with unpleasant words, okay? The computer shows the same thing. All right, so that, I think this is already cool enough to put into a good journal, but, um, but what makes it sensational is we have the same thing with race, okay? And so the, again, this was a huge finding that some people were doubting. Nobody wanted to know that they had these prejudices. And let me say, it isn't that everyone has a prejudice. This is about the implicit association. So how quickly you can implicitly do things. Scientists had already proven that the implicit associations are not directly correlated to explicit behavior. Okay, so what you choose to do, who you choose to work with, you may actually have a small implicit bias but be really racist, or you could have a big implicit bias and not be racist at all. All right, so that's an important distinction for the humans, not for the computer. For the computer, we've only got the words. We've only done this measure, so that's all we have. All right. So similarly with gender, and because I only have 25 minutes, I'm only showing you three results here. Okay, but we, we, every one of the results that have been done using words by the psychologists, we found the same result, okay, for all the papers. All right, so this is super cool. <laughs> that I actually, um, this shows that only using Words, just reading words off the internet. I didn't tell you that. The words just came from the internet. It was the English language web, okay? So um, we actually did two things. With the Stanford set, we used the English language web. With the Google set, we used Google News. And again, those were just things that were provided by those two. So, so the words from Google News and the words from just the English language internet. So just having, by looking and counting words, you can find out something visceral. Right? You can find out something visceral, like the fact that insects are unpleasant. All right? That's amazing. What's a little disturbing because of what we know about the, the prejudicial results is that the same process also gets at true facts about the world. Okay, so you can say, well, insects pleasant, is that true? Well, it's kind of visceral, right? But here is some actual statistics. So on the left, is the 2015 U.S. labor statistics where for a particular word um, on the bottom, on the x-axis on the bottom, that's how many people held that job or what proportion of people that held that job were women. Sorry, okay. So on the left, the blue dots are things like programmer, unfortunately. I used to be a programmer, but there's hardly any women programmers left. It's really weird. Anyway, and on the right, in the red, is, is um, upper right of the left side, is things like being a nurse, where there's hardly any men. Okay, so that's what's on the bottom. What's on the side is exactly the same representation that gave us those sexist results before about math, and also about um, being more domestic and less, less interested in careers, things like that. Okay, so the same stuff the, and oh, I didn't tell you what the right graph is. The right graph is just um, what proportion of people who have a name that could be either male or female, like Sandy or Alex, 
at least in American English. Those are words, names that both men and women have. So, and this correlation is not quite as strong, although still 84 is strong, but the most recent census we could find for that was 1990. So I would predict that if you could find out today's numbers, you would be very close to 100. Because part of the reason we only, only have 90% correlation on the labor statistics is because jobs have more than one word, and this technique only works for one word at a time. Okay, so that's, that's the weakness. I mean, 90% correlation is great, but, but we could have done better. Um, okay, so what does all this mean? The implications are, well, possibly when we think about, this is how uh, computer scientists talk about bias. So bias is just a regularity that you've observed. It's information, it's what you want. Remember at the beginning, I said the brain was biased to understand certain kinds of information. So bias is just information. It just means there's regularities in the world. A stereotype, and this is the new idea, is that the stereotype, well, we have the word stereotype. It's, some, it's bad beliefs, right? That, like those implicit associations. Um, but what we propose, given that we showed this re relation to the uh, reality, is that of all the biases that you might learn, the stereotypes are the ones that society has decided we don't want anymore. So it's a fact, for example, for the domestic things, that women have stayed home longer and men have had more careers. That's just a fact. But we call it a stereotype because we don't want it to be a fact any longer. All right? And then um, the, the point from an artificial intelligence perspective is that there's no, there's no way for the machine to know the difference. Right? Um, prejudice, and now this is technical, this is out of sociology. Prejudice is when you act on stereotypes. So this goes back to that complicated part about the implicit bias. It's not bad to have the implicit bias, it's bad to act on the implicit bias. Okay, and that's when you call it prejudice. All right, so it would be bad if we let AI act on the thing that it absorbed directly from culture. All right, okay, back to the title of this whole meeting. Um, if AI shares our prejudices, does that make it a person? Okay, no. All right, thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. I, I will give you, how many minutes have I got left? I still have seven, good, okay. Because I gotta give you five reasons not to other AI, and believe me, there's a couple more slides too. Reason number one, moral hazard. Do you know what that means? It means something that attracts you to doing bad, okay? So we already think, when we see something that reminds us of a human, we treat it like a human. Even little babies, when they see humanoid robots, they treat them differently from robots that are just boxes, okay? So we're basically pre-programmed to think that something that looks human, we should be nice to it, okay? Um, so that means that well before we actually have created AI that deserves human status, people will be arguing that deserves human status. And that means that we can be exploited, all right? So it means that a politician, probably not Angela Merkel, could blame a robot for blowing up a village, right? Uh, a robot, a robot uh, uh, weapon, right? Or that um, a commercial body could blame a robot or could say that a robot was a person and was responsible for its own tax liabilities, even though the, that robot is doing business for the, the commercial organization, right? So, um, no, reason number two, second order moral patiency. What I mean here is, uh, uh, let me show you what I mean. Let's do the build. Why would we want to build robots that would suffer? Okay, why would we want them to, to mind being owned, right? So, what I mean is that I think it would be unethical towards the robot to make it possible to be unethical towards the robot. That's why it's second order. I apologize for those of you struggling with, I apologize to the translators, right? But it, <laughs> but you don't, um, moral patiency is something that we are obliged to take care of, and what I'm saying is that we are obliged to make sure that we are not obliged to robots, okay? So, right, There's, there it is in text. We are obliged to build robots we are not obliged to. Some people think this is a, sta a double standard, no. What I'm saying is pick one standard, decide what it is to be obliged to something, what, what makes people special, and then don't build that, okay? For example, 
for let you, one thing about humans is we're unique, right? And, and if we're killed, then we're lost forever. You could back up a robot's brain if you build it correctly, right? You could, you could say, we want to make sure that we can back up the brain. Okay, that's just one example. Okay, number three, fear of robot apocalypse. Everybody looking for Arnold Schwarzenegger and going, oh, where's the glowing eyes, right? It's distracting us from the fact that AI is already a threat, right? It's a promise, too. It's doing all sorts of cool, really cool things. I'm not an AI, you know, skeptic. But there are all kinds of things. When we increase communication, we also increase interdependence. And this is making it harder to govern. All the companies and all the things that we're able to do things, we do work for Google and Facebook and, you know, airline companies, Austrian Airlines, to had me typing in forms for it right? And it didn't pay me for that. Well, it kind of did. We barter, right? We get a lower price, they get some labor, and everybody's happy, except there's no tax. There's no denomination, there's no tax, and then you have massive inequality building up in the OECD, right? And all the money goes in a few little piles. So all kinds of things are happening that way. Of course, all the issues of privacy, which I think Sandra's going to talk about. So I, where, where did Sandra go? I'm completely confused being in a circle. Anyway, <laughs> are you going to talk about privacy? Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so, right. So, pretending that AI is something that might be a threat in 60 years ignores the discussions we should be having now. So, please don't let people tell you, oh, that's not real AI. It's really already here, and we already are more intelligent, and we're able to perceive things we could never perceive before and predict things we could never predict before about each other's behavior. And that can be dangerous. Okay. Fourth, now it gets more, again, sorry, <laughs> translators, now we're going to get more, more obscure, although actually German is a good language for this, right? Um, people try to figure out what's special about people, and I think the main special thing is that we invented the whole idea of being special, right? Every species, uh, every social species works together. That's sort of what defines a social species, right? So we are here, and, and the way we make things work is by being social. And so we define, our society defines the entire concept of responsibility, and we enforce it, and we've evolved to be in that kind of a context. So for example, you know, it, if you have a little child, and that child is excluded, it doesn't matter how well you raise them and how you know, well-balanced and everything, if that child is excluded um, socially, even if an adult is socially excluded, it hurts them. It lowers their life expectancy, right? And that's true for fish, too. Dogs, fish, apes. Um, it doesn't have to be true for robots, right? We have a choice about how to build these things, right? In fact, when we build something, good design, good engineering that we can be responsible for tends to be modular. So suffering is an inextricable. It's something you cannot take out of being an animal, right? But it's anything is extricable from a modular AI, right? So this is why uh, the whole concept of design, a well-designed AI suffering is incoherent. Now, we could talk about other things like scanning in brains. Now, I'm not sure that's technically feasible, but if you did, you basically have a clone. And I am not talking here about clones. If you build a clone, then of course, it's like a human, and most of us think we shouldn't build clones because it's wrong to own other humans, right? All right. So finally, this sort of leads into my final point, the fifth reason, is uh, a legal lacuna. And this is something I'm very worried about uh, in Europe. In general, I'm a big fan of the European Union, but there's a small part of an otherwise great document that talked about um, making artificial intelligence, in some cases, to be humans, okay? If we assign personhood to artifacts, then we allow other individuals and organizations to get out of their tax and legal liabilities. We're basically rewarding businesses for fully automating part of their business process. That means taking away human jobs, right? We're rewarding them for that and then saying, oh yeah, and you have a cap on how much liability you have. So you, the, the business might endow it. Sorry, does that mean I'm out of time? Okay, so I better get going. So yeah, try suing a bankrupt robot. This is already a problem with shell, with shell companies, it would be, and they have humans. It'd be even worse if there's nothing that can suffer at that, 
at the back. So yeah, my nightmare. Autocrats willing money and power to AI self-caricatures. So what about the prejudice? I'm sorry, I should have gone faster on the five things. <laughs> There's at least three sources of AI bias. The way you fix it, um, in this case, the one I showed you before, automatically uh, absorbing from, from, uh, um, by machine learning from culture, we do what we do. You have explicit as well as implicit. You, have, you say there's things that we don't do, like say sexist things, right? Um, I, I should probably skip over this very quickly. I'll just say, I think Sandra's talking about this too, so I'll skip this. Um, but sometimes people aren't sufficiently diverse, so we can diversify. The biggest problem, remember, AI is an artifact. Artifacts are built, sorry. Artifacts are built, and so the biggest concern is somebody just builds it deliberately wrong. All right? I think, you know, AI has an architecture, brains have architectures, AI has architecture, real architects are regulated. Architects learn laws, policy, and how to work with governments and legislatures at their schools. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, after a few centuries of buildings falling down on people, everyone got tired of it, and so they organized and they forced architects to, to, to be regulated. Um, arguably, right now, uh, some AI has fallen down on some countries, and uh, maybe a lot of countries. Um, so it may also be that we might want to think about um, doing something similar. So my conclusions are AI already exists, it affects us all. If you construct it from machine learning, from our culture, then it's going to share our biases, which is all of our knowledge, but also our prejudice. And the European Parliament is, uh, although I just complained about the uh, e-person thing, generally I think it's awesome that this year they're thinking about how to uh, deal with AI, and in particular about regulating it. I think it's the time to do that. So thank you to my collaborators on this work. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I'm inviting now uh, Dr. Sandra Wachter, uh, and I'm obliged to make a short introduction. Um, Dr. Sandra Wachter is a lawyer and postdoctoral research in data ethics and algorithms at the Oxford in Internet Institute. Sandra is a member of the Ethics and Philosophy of Information Research Cluster and the Digital Ethics Lab. She's also a Turing Research Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London, a member of the Law Committee of the IEE, and serves as a policy advisor for governments and NGOs around the world on regulatory and ethical questions concerning emerging technologies. Prior to joining the OII, Sandra worked at the Royal Academy of Engineering on topics such as connectivity, AI, and autonomous systems. Sandra's research focuses on the legal and ethical implication of big data, AI, and robotics, as well as governmental surveillance, predictive policing, and human rights online. Her current research, um, yes, her current research focuses on ethical design of, of algorithms, including the development of standards and methods to ensure fairness, accountability, transparency, interpretability, and a group privacy in complex algorithmic systems. Please, hello, Mr. Sandra Wachter. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am very happy to be here, as I'm Austrian, so it's very nice to be back home. Um, I, as, as has been said, I do stuff on the ethical and legal implications of emerging technologies. And in my talk today, I want to get two messages across. Um, the first is I believe that lawyers and policymakers unfortunately don't always understand how technology works, which is reflected in the legal frameworks, and we can see um, that they don't fully understand how it works. And the second thing is I think policymakers and lawyers need to understand ethics a bit better. And ethics needs to be factored into um, uh, decision-making procedures when laws are designed. And to bring this claim a bit further, I'm going to talk about um, the legal and the ethical side of robotics and AI. And I want to talk first about two European frameworks 
that I'm going to use as an example to show you why I think there is a fair chance that there are major accountability gaps that we're going to face in Europe. And then I propose a couple of examples of how to close those gaps. And then I want to move on and talk about the ethics, which is not what's legally required, but what's ethically desired in a society. I want to start with the call for lawyers and policymakers, and actually probably whole of society, to really understand how technology works. And I think the most important thing is that we have a holistic view of AI and robotics. We need to understand that big data and automated decision making. Automated decision making means an algorithm is making a decision about you as a human being, which is also often coupled with AI. And robotics, they have similarities. They are deployed in similar areas, they fulfill certain tasks that are similar, and therefore they have the same problems. So for example, we use um, AI and robotics in the workplace. So if you apply for a job nowadays, an algorithm might be used to filter CVs out. The algorithm is making the decision whether you get a job interview. An algorithm is making a decision if you get hired or fired or promoted. Um, uh, robotics are also often used in the workplace as co-workers, service robots, for example. So they are becoming part of the, mar of the job market. Um, algorithms and robotics, they are also used in the criminal justice sector. So, for example, um, judges use algorithms to decide whether somebody should go to prison, how long they should go for prison, if they should be granted parole. They are being used for predictive policing. And robots as well. We have policing robots, patrolling robots. They're fulfilling similar tasks. Health sector, also increasingly important. So medical professions like doctors use expert systems for diagnosis, for treatment plans. We have robots in the healthcare sector for surgeries, for example, for care. And transport. Nowadays we have a GPS on our cell phone that routes us. Soon we're going to have autonomous cars driving us in the streets. So you can see that they're similar, they're doing similar tasks. And they, what they have in common is they use big data and they make decisions about us. They decide whether you're going to get a job, if you go to prison, and how to operate on you. So if they're similar, they have similar problems. And one of the main problems with AI, and Joanna already said that, is AI often works as a black box. It's very hard to understand. It's opaque and it's inscrutable and therefore often a host for biases and discrimination, which is a problem, especially if we have AI and robotics making decisions about us that deeply affect us. So what is it that we actually expect when AI and robotics make decisions about us? We want them to be fair, accountable and transparent. So what could help us to achieve those goals? One of the ideas is to make AI and robotics more explainable. If I have to lay out all the reasons that led to my conclusions, you can then assess if I was wrong, if I was fair, if I was illegal, you can assess that. In Europe, we actually started a very interesting discussion of making something could, uh, like a right to explanation legally binding. A right to explanation would mean that I have the right to ask for an explanation when an algorithm is making a decision about us. And in Europe, we have borne this idea, I want to say, with the new framework that will come into force next year. This is the European Union's um, General Data Protection Regulation, which is interesting, because as of next year, in March, it will be applicable in all member states of the European Union, and will set a new data protection standard in Europe. And it has been discussed by legal scholars and in the public media whether this new framework gives individuals a right to ask about an to get an explanation when algorithms are making decisions about us. Um, before I go into detail what's actually in the legal framework, I want to take a step back and talk about explanations. What does explanation mean? It could be either of those things, maybe probably 15 other things, but two of those things are implicit in the new framework. You could either think about explanation about, uh, explanation about system functionality, so how the system functions in general, and, or, you can think about an explanation about the rationale about an individual decision. Just to give you a basic example, if I apply for a job, um, my maybe future boss could tell me, well, I'm going to collect a bunch of data about you, I'm going to use your um, work experience, your reference letters, your grades, and I'm going to run my algorithm through it, and my algorithm will decide 
whether or not I will hire you. This is a basic description, explanation of how the system works. A different kind of explanation would be the rationale after a decision has been made. So in cases if I don't get that job, that, this, that the employer tells me, well, it's because your grades weren't good enough or your reference letters weren't good. So the particular individual points that led to the individual decision. So very two different kinds of explanations. Um, what has been discussed in the recent months and in the media and academic papers, even in policy reports, is that it is believed that the new European framework, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, will give everybody in Euro Europe the right to ask for an explanation whenever an algorithm is making a decision about you. So an explanation about the rationales or the individual circumstances. And I thought that was quite interesting and it would be groundbreaking if we had that. So uh, me and my co-authors, we looked at the legal framework and we wrote a paper saying that we don't actually think that's going to be happening um, according to the law. So we wrote a paper where a right to explanation does not exist together with um, Dr. Brent Middlestadt and Luciano Ferridi, Professor Luciano Ferridi, um, both also at the University of Oxford. Um, and we assessed the legal framework and came up with a couple of ideas why we think that we actually think there is not going to be a legally mandated right. And the paper was actually interesting because it launched a public discussion, um, especially in the UK, where the House of Commons has now launched a public inquiry on whether we need new mechanisms to regulate and whether the European framework is actually sufficient to guard against those risks like biases, discrimination. So I don't have much time. I want to just give you a couple of pointers, what we found out in that paper, and I have to be a bit technical with the legal stuff, but you will see later what is important to understand. Um, so I hope it's not going to be too boring and too technical, but I'll try my best. Um, I'm going to reverse it and give you the conclusion of the paper first and then give you the explanation how we how we arrived at that. So what we think will be legally mandated in Europe is that the framework will give you a right to be informed. A right to be informed if someone is planning on making decisions about you using an algorithm. And if they're planning on doing that, they have to give you information about how the system works. So as I said, a basic description of the system functionality. But, and this is very important, those safeguards will only kick in if the decision-making process is solely automated. That means that there is no human in the loop, which is tricky, because if you think about the hiring decisions, I could use an algorithm to decide whether I should get the job, but if I tell you I'm not going to hire you, it's not an automated decision anymore, because the final say was not the algorithm, it was a human. So that's already very narrow, so which opens up a box, of can, a, a box of worms because you could just insert a human somewhere in the organization and completely avoid those safeguards to kick in. And the second thing is, you're only going to have safeguards if the automated decision has legal or other significant effects, which is a high bar. And it's not really clear what that means. But even if you have that, you're not going to have a right to explanation about the rationale behind an individual decision. So, and now I'm going to quickly walk you through um, the main arguments that we made in that paper. So, this is the legal text, and I promise I only have two legal slides, and then I'll have something with pretty pictures too. So, this is Article 22 of the General Data Protection Regulation that, regulated, that regulates automated decision making. So, algorithms that are making decisions about you. And this will create a right for everybody that you have the right not to be subject of that automated decision. There are certain exemptions from that, and if one of the exemptions kicks, kicks in, you have other safeguards at your disposal. One of them is to obtain human intervention. That means you get a decision and you can request that you could talk to a human being, basically someone with a pulse. That's going to be one of the safeguards. You have also the right to express your view and to contest the decision, which is very good and great, but it doesn't say anything about an explanation. It's, it's not there. You can check. I checked various times. It's not there. So the question is, why has this been dis dis discussed in Europe? Why did this rumor about the right to explanation emerge? And this is the answer. The right to explanation is only mentioned once in the whole GDPR 
in Recital 71. So, recitals are, it's, themselves are not legally binding. They only give you guidance, like for example for judges, on how to interpret the legally binding, enforceable text if there is ambiguity. But they cannot create standalone rights. They are not enforceable. They cannot create other rights that are not in the legally binding text. And what's interesting here is the safeguards that I mentioned, obtaining human intervention, talk to a human being, contesting the decision, um, expressing your views, they are all in the recital and in the legally binding text. But the interesting distinction is the right to explanation is not. And funny background story about that. We looked at the trilog negotiations. So this is the, the negotiations between, that happened during the four years when the framework was drafted between the European Parliament, the Commission and the Council. And the European Parliament saw that loophole and said, please put it in the legally binding text. We want that. It was not adopted in the end. So you can see there was political will to give birth to an idea, but not give it the full legal standing that the other safeguards have, which is interesting. Um, doesn't mean it could be developed over time, but I doubt that it's going to be enforceable in court. However, there are two, three other um, provisions in the GDPR, and this is where I base my argument for system functionality on, they're going to give you some transparency mechanisms to understand what's happening to your data. So this is Article 13 to 15 in the GDPR. Um, 14, uh, 13 and 14 are notification duties. Notification duties means as soon as a data controller, that could be a company, that could be anyone, somebody who's planning on processing your personal data as soon as they collect the data, they have to inform you about the existence of automated decision-making. So they have to inform you, hey, we're going to use your data because we want to achieve A, B, and C. I'm going to use your data to decide whether you get a loan, whether you're going to be admitted to university, whether you get fired. They have to tell you this in advance before they start the processing. And in that time, they have to give you meaningful information about the logic involved, the envisioned consequences, um, and the significance. That means they have to tell you, we're going to lose an algorithm, we're going to run it, basic description of how it works, the aim and the purpose of that. So this happens before the decision has been made, which means logically it cannot be about the rationale because the decision making has not happened yet. You could also request the same information at any time using the right of access, which is Article 15, but you're going to get the same information. This counter mechanism is just designed to give you a right to ask about the same information in case, for example, data controller for forgets to inform you. So you have some leverage to get this information. So in my opinion, I believe that we're going to have some kind of transparency mechanism, but certainly not a full fenced right to explanation that gives you very detailed information about how the decision was reached. However, European Union has multiple um, objectives at the moment, and the other one is the European Civil Law Rules for Robotics, um, which has been discussed for various months now, drafts have been, pass been, been passed, working groups have, have been established. Um, and what the European Union wants to do is to figure out if we need new rules that govern robotics. Um, and we looked at that framework in particular, and we found a very interesting section there as well which is Section 7. And it says here that the European Parliament urges the Commission to design new laws for robotics, and if they do that, they want them to be in full compliance with the data protection framework that I just introduced to you, especially concerning information obligations, which is the notification duties and the right of access, so the right to know about system functionality, and here's the old friend, a right to obtain an explanation after the decision has been reached. So, okay, interesting. Maybe it's not in the data protection framework. Maybe they're just going to introduce that right using civil law rules for robotics. And actually, that would not be a bad idea. Because if you look at robotics, explaining robotic behavior could be very helpful. I've listed a couple of applications here. So you see policing robots. If you get arrested because a robot thinks that you're a threat, you might want to know why. If you ride an autonomous car and you have a crash, you might want to know what happened in the process. Same comes true if robots are being used for surgical procedures or for care. 
or if we have them as companion robots or, or, or toys because they are interacting with you know, um, vulnerable groups like elderly or children, we want to make sure that, if, that the systems are safe. So if something fails, we want to know what happened. And needless to say that weapons is obviously something that is in, where accountability mechanisms are important. If they targeted someone and it's the wrong target, we want the right explanation for that. So if we get, okay, interesting, maybe, maybe it's a different route. Maybe we get a right to explanation in this way. But, as you can imagine, we wrote another paper um, together with Dr. Brent Middleton for a professor at Jennifer Reedy, which was recently published in Science Robotics, um, Transparent, Explainable, and Accountable AI for Robotics, where we looked at that framework a bit closer, and we are not quite hopeful with that either. And the main reason for that is, if you remember Section 7, that I showed you where they called for this um, accountability mechanism, this is the section that was passed. So this is the resolution that was actually passed by the Parliament and has been sent to the European Commission. That part, the information duties, so information about system functionality and the right to explanation, have been taken out again. That does not mean that the European Commission could somehow factor that into the decision-making process. They could still design laws that take account for that. But I'm just stressing that it does not seem that there is strong political will to push for that, especially considering that the European Parliament in the data protection framework pushed for a right to explanation, and now they're not even doing that anymore. So it's not a good time for accountability mechanisms in Europe, um, but we still had some hope. We said, okay, maybe there is nothing about robotic behavior. Maybe there's an explanation for AI. Again, as, as you could tell, um, the framework, the proposed framework, doesn't seem to encompass that either. The good thing about that draft is that the draft seems to understand much better than the GDPR that AI and robotics are connected because, for example, they call for an agency for AI and robotics, so they seem that those things are connected. They also think about, they call for, you know, design mechanisms to understand the logic and the rationale of, 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 of um, robotic behavior. But they don't give any guidance, they don't propose anything, they don't talk about biases, discrimination, accountability mechanism, fair, transparent um, decision making, like everything that is being discussed in the AI community is completely left out. The framework itself basically focuses on robotic liability questions, so what happens if you know, somebody gets injured. But the whole bias discrimination problem with AI is mainly disregarded, which is a problem. As I said, the, one of the main um, goals of my talk is to urge that lawmakers and lawyers need to understand how these things are connected, that automated decision-making, big data, AI, and robotics are connected. And to give you an example, why I think this holistic view is very important, I'm going to give you two examples, actually. The first is in criminal justice. So, this is Predpol. Predpol is a predictive policing software that is used by, um, by the police. How it works is it's fed with a lot of data, and then it predicts criminal hotspots. So it calculates the probability that a crime will happen in a certain area. What happens then is then that, that, that police officers are being dispatched there, and they start patrolling and see if there's any suspicious behavior. And if there is, if, yeah, so if there is any, they might arrest someone software doing predictive policing. This is Nightscope. This is a policing robot that basically does the same thing. It's patrolling up and down the road and is scanning if something is suspicious, for example, here with the weapon. What the robot does is calls the police and tells them, hey, send over some, some um, officers. Now I'm asking you, if you get arrested, do you really care if a robot or a software made a decision about you? Not really. You're going to want to know why you have been classified as someone who is dangerous, regardless of the hardware and the software involved. And the second thing is, even if I'm wrong about all of this, even if there is somehow, magically, this right to explanation in the legally binding framework, we're going to have massive accountability gaps because it does not fit. 
if you look at the framework itself, it just does not fit for robots. And I want to give you the example of an autonomous car. Imagine that you're sitting in an autonomous car and you have a crash, and you want to invoke your right to explanation. In order to get those safeguards, the first thing needs to apply. You need to be a data subject. A data subject is a person whose data is being processed. If you're sitting in a car, your data is not really processed. It's the environmental data that is being processed. So you might not be the data subject and you don't have any rights. The second thing is, all the safeguards will only kick in if an algorithm is making a decision about you. Well, the car is not really making a decision about you. It's making a decision about whether somebody is a dog, somebody is a pedestrian, or something is not a car. It's not making a decision about the human who is sitting in the car. So none of the safeguards would apply. The next thing is, as I told you, decision-making process needs to be solely automated. Well, most of those cars are not solely automated yet. They're semi-solely automated. So none of those safeguards will kick in either. And significant effects. I mean, it's undoubtful if you have a car crash that this is a significant effect. But if you look at the legal framework, what they think of significant effects, it's about loan applications and job applications. So it's not about autonomous driving at all. Nonetheless, those rights will apply, but might be useless, as you can see with the safeguards that you want to may maybe invoke. So imagine you have a crash. You have the right to obtain human intervention, to express your view, and to contest the decision. So I'm asking you, if you have a car crash, how are you going to contest a decision? The decision that it was not brake but accelerated? The decision that something was classified as a human and not a dog? Are you going to go back in time and choose a different route? Like, contesting a decision when it comes to car crashes is probably very um, useless. But this is what I said, this is why I, we need to understand how technology works to design a framework that accounts for those things, that understands how technology works. So this was the legal stuff. And now I'm going to make things a bit more complicated because now ethic comes in. And because ethic, ethics always ask very uncomfortable questions that we also need to take into account for. Because legal compliance is not the only thing that is important about new technologies, it's also the ethics thing. We need to think about other things as well. Law just regulates after we have decided that we invite new technologies in our society. Ethics asks the question, should we do this in the first place? So, for example, we, what about ethical impact assessment? Is automation always ethical? Are we kind of shifting moral responsibility towards a machine? Are we getting off the hook of being struggled with a certain decision? Do we need to rely on algorithms? Must we not rely on algorithms in certain contexts? For example, predictive policing, right? Or judiciary. If a judge, like I want to understand that a judge is struggling of making the decision of some, if somebody should go to prison, maybe we shift him more responsibility if he's just going to press a button and say, well, computer said so, you have to go to prison. Maybe this human element of struggling needs to be there. Maybe it's not ethical to do that. The same comes true if you think about um, AI and robotics used in care especially care, where we have human-human interaction, where we have doctors having very personal relationships with their patients. If we shift everything towards a robot, is that ethical? Or is it okay? Is this, the new, is this a new area and it's completely okay to do that, right? So it's very important to think about whether using algorithms at all times and robotics at all times is actually a good idea. The next thing is, and I think Joanna already touched on that, is ethical design. This is a design question. How do we design robots and AI that are ethical? So, for example, chatbot. If you book a flight nowadays, you go online and you usually have like a chat assistant coming up and you know, advising you what to click. Sometimes they are designed so well that it's not fully clear that this is not another human. Should there be a, like, a requirement that it's always clear that you're talking to an AI? Same comes true for AI assistants, right? If you look at Alexa and, and Siri, you know, they all have women voices. How do we feel about the fact that we're using something that is a servant and attaching a woman's voice to it? Is that ethical, right? We're using care and companion robots who are not human beings. As Joanna said, they're not human beings. But by designing it in a cute, adorable way, is that ethical? Should we do that? Should we really blur the boundaries between AI and humans and robotics? And of course, weapons. You know, weapons are designed to kill people. How should we design them? 
And the last thing on ethics I want to touch on is ethical responsibility in general and automation. Even if we embrace those new technologies, we need to think about what that means for our society. If we start massively automation, uh, automating all jobs, what happens to the people that are currently holding those positions, right? Should we re-educate them? Will that be enough if we just re-educate everyone? I don't think I'm going to be a computer sci a scientist in my life. Like, I, I could not possibly retrain to do that. But would others be able to do that? Should we tax robots? Should we actually have universal basic income, which is currently um, tested in Finland, for example, to exactly cater for the uncertainty that we don't know what's going to happen if we massively automate all the jobs? Or should we have an automation fund? Should we all as a society chip in and say, OK, we don't know what the future will bring, but we all are going to contribute to a certain fund to secure um, income in the future? So this is the ethical component. I want to close with just to recapture that I think two things are very important to use the full potential of AI. And again, I'm not a tech um, dystopian. I very much believe in the, in the possibilities of tech. But it's important that we, when we're designing new rules that we understand how technology works so we don't end up with a framework that is not applicable or has too many gaps to be actually successful. And we need to factor in how to use those technologies in a sensible, ethical way. So tech, law, and ethics need to work on this together to design a framework so we can actually fully harness the potential of new technologies. Thank you. Hi, Sandra. Sandra, may you stay here? And Joanna, can you join me? I, I unconsciously hacked the system, but I got the approval from the system that we can do a Q and answer, Q and A now, because the atmosphere is heated enough. I think that the topic is really interesting. So please, hands up. Who would like? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity, uh, Mrs. Wächter. Thank you for a very strong uh, speech. Uh, I try to be specific. Um, I'm, in, I'm going as a tourist to the United States. I get off at a joint. I smoke it. I get arrested and will be sent to jail for 20 years. Do you think that a artificial intelligence would do that? Do you know the background of my question? Or, I mean, uh, if human beings are doing these things. Why shouldn't I be afraid of artificial intelligence if humans are maybe even more scarier? Thank you. It's, it's, well, I'd love to go, and it's okay. okay. Because, because you, the, yeah, the, because, well, I'm going to say something challenging to you so then you can come back. Because, okay. because yeah, one of the things, I, you did much better at keeping time than I did, but that I glanced over very quickly was that one good thing about artificial intelligence is that if it is transparent, then when there's a poor decision, it's there explicit, and we can go back and we can, we can keep improving it. So when there's a mistake made, and to some extent, you can even think of the legal system as artificial intelligence in that sense. We already do sort of iteratively improve it. So in some ways, uh, for example, with the driverless cars, you know, they have all these questions about should it hit the pedestrian or save the person inside. We already have that problem. The SUVs are already a decision to kill the person outside to save the person inside. And that was a decision taken um, for economic and political reasons that these things that are basically trucks were, were called cars, right? Now we get to revisit that decision and we could change it, right? Um, so I'm not sure if I have, I had a feeling this was challenging what you were saying, but, I, but the, um, on the other hand, if you're talking, and this is what the Obama administration was very worried about in the United States, was if we snapshot how things are right now, so if we grabbed a time when you got 20 years for your first offense, and, and as the Obama administration said, if we encode the results of 200 years of bad policy into our AI now, Right, so, so maybe, you know, because you're Dutch, it's more likely that, I don't know if you're Dutch, but if you're, because you're Dutch, you're more likely to get this, uh, this uh, 
accusation or somebody that's more likely to search you with a sniffer dog or something, right? Um, so, so, yeah, so, so we don't want the prior set by something historic and then carved, you know, into the AI and never updated. And that, so that... Yeah. No, I, I actually agree. I, I think that AI... Uh, that AI has, has potential to, to make decisions fairer and more transparent, and especially because AI is not a human, right? So with humans, well, they can give you all kinds of explanation why they make decisions, right? If you don't get the job, and I think it's because I'm a woman, I'm just going to say, no, it's because of your grades. There's just no way to really know. I could always lie to you. I can deceive you. I could also bribe you, right? Well, that, I could also believe that that was true and not know myself yeah. that I'm sexist. Exactly. I'm a woman. Am I sexist? Probably, right? The implicit association test would show that. Yeah. But so, I could believe that I'm not. Yeah, so, so you have all kinds of implicit and explicit biases. This is just human nature. And algorithms don't have that like in their nature because it's not their nature. What they have, they have different problems because they, they learn from biased data and the data is biased because we are biased and we are biased because we're humans, right? But with technology, we can at least find those biases and then actively act against them. So if you're hiring for a job, for example, so what you would do is, right, you have an algorithm and you feed it with all historical data of people who have held previous positions in the past, similar positions, right? And if I have a bunch of data set from the last 50 years of people who have held professorships, well, it will be someone who is white and male and they would filter me out. But with those systems, we can at least see that and then act against them and have affirmative action for certain groups that we want to protect. I, w I would say another piece about this, about why another, okay, bad thing about AI, because that makes it sound like AI, well, we should just use AI, and a lot of people want that to be true. But there's an awful lot of our intelligence and our experience that we don't put into words because we share them and we don't need to say so much about it. And that stuff is going to be very opaque to AI. So it... As I said, I think it's best to think of AI as an extension of human intelligence, that once we understand something well enough to make rules, that we can encode it there. But I think it's a good idea to keep humans in the loop, uh, checking that the, the systems make sense, because there are a lot of unstated assumptions that we forget are unstated. If I make an amendment, uh, you mentioned architects. Who is controlling, who is watching the architects? Who is educating the architects? Yeah. Okay, this is a second question. Um, the, who, who watches the architects? Um, currently, basically no one. Software came out of nowhere, and uh, I mean, there's obligations. The market watches them, you know. But um, the idea is that, uh, that we may get to the situation where we do have auditing. So, for example, a couple of cases have been decided in the United States where if someone said, uh, like in Idaho, um, if someone said, oh, you can't know how the AI decided this thing. So, so what happened was this, that people suddenly got less money for their disabilities in the state of Idaho. And they asked why, and they said, you can't know because it's in a spreadsheet and it's a secret, it's IP. Um, and the, the, the Civil Liberties Union took uh, that case and took it to court and they were able to, to the, the court said, that's not due process. So human is, deserves due process. And then when they went to look at the AI, it was a mess. Nobody could see what was going on. But that may have been what somebody paid them to do. Someone could have said, Idaho is running out of money. Find a way to save money and make it impossible for people to see. And that goes back to the thing about um, we, we, need, we need to think about uh, how do we want to audit these pieces. And we also have to think about possibly transnational, because if we're talking about software uh, that's been accused of altering election outcomes, say, well, the elected party is probably the beneficiary, right? So, so there's some, uh, I think that this is a very nice place for the EU to be in, and, and structures like the EU. Actually, the EU is saying the UN should do it. <laughs> so if, 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 you, if you look at uh, some of the ethics uh, pieces I was looking at for AI, yeah. We are 10 minutes behind the schedule, so uh, no more questions, please uh, have a but we'll seat. Stay around, right? Yeah, uh, it's at uh, the end, so maybe somebody uh, can pose a question again. Yeah. Um, I will uh, invite the next speaker now, 
Mr. Zimbo Hidaka from Japan, who is going to uh, talk about spirituality and artificial intelligence. While he's preparing, I will read a short intro. Uh, yes, I guess this is working. Would you prefer uh, to have a, a hand? Yeah, handset. I will give it to you. Uh, Mr. Zembo Hidaka, Koyasan Sambo, in Deputy Chief Priest, in Koyasan Koso, in Chief Priest Hidaka Zembo, graduated University of Tokyo, Faculty of Law and Faculty of Law. During his PhD course, he established an IT startup to develop softwares. Later, he founded a Japan style incorporation and conducted Japanese performing arts productions such as Tsuguru. Yamisen and traditional Okinawa music performances in Central Asia, Middle East and Canada in association with the Japan Foundation. Foundation. In 2007, he was appointed for the committee member of Japan Luxury Travel Forum organized by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Currently, he serves as a priest in Koyasan Koso in Koyasan Koso in and as a deputy chief priest in Koyasan Sambo Inn, as well as a board member of local area branding association. Please welcome. Uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, it is a great honor to be here today to speak to this very distinguished audience. I am a Zenbo Hidaka, as you can see, a priest from Koyasan, Japan. I think there, there are many people who probably do not know about Koyasan, so let me introduce briefly about Koyasan. Koyasan was founded by Kukai twelve hundred years ago as a place for Shingon Buddhists to train their spirit through meditation. Koyasan is a religious area in approximately 900 meters in altitude. 117 temples lined up, registered as a World Heritage Site in 2004. Koyasan is uh, also a tourist spot located about an hour's drive from Kansai Airport and is crowded with tourists from all over the world. Koyasan won three stars of Green Michelin Japan. In 2015, the National Geographic nominated Koyasan as one of the top 20 destinations to visit. Koyasan has two main spots. One is Danjo Garam, a sacred temple complex which expresses the teachings of Shingon Buddhism in three dimensional. The other is Okunoin, which is a site of the Muslim of Kukai. There are more than 200,000 tombstones lined up between over 800-year-old sugi trees. When Jean Paul Sartre visited Koyasan, he said that it was the most beautiful cemetery in the world where death and nature united. My role is to create an interface between tradition and modern issues. Today, we are discussing about artificial intelligence from ethics, philosophy, and spirituality. In order to discuss artificial intelligence, we must deeply understand what the intelligence is in the first place. From Koyasan, I can offer to introduce our founder, Kukai, who was an extraordinary intellect. Who is Kukai? 
it is hard to explain him in one word. The first Japanese Nobel Prize winner, Hideki Yukawa, expresses Kukai as In the long history of Japan, Kukai was the most versatile genius. Even on a global scale, his scope of activity is wider than people like Aristotle and Leonardo da Vinci. A wide range of achievements for the religion, literature, art, academia, technology, social projects is phenomenal. Another noteworthy thing is that probably Kukai was the first Japanese to build its own ideological system. Considering that the difference between Japan and China at that time was very large, this is also miraculous. This is his manuscript, uh, nominated as a national treasure in Japan. This is a calligraphy, a sculpture. It's also a national treasure. It is interesting to see a theoretical physicist to talk about a religious person in this way. The secret of Kukai's outstanding genius should lead to discussing the possibilities of intelligence. Let's see why he was able to acquire such outstanding ability. Kukai said as follows, then I met a Buddhist priest who instructed me in the meditative practice of Akasha Garuba, known as Gumonji Ho. The Gumonji Ho scripture says, if one recites this mantra properly one million times, one will memorize of all the scriptures, as well as the meaning of the all meanings of all the scriptures. Trusting the sincere words of the Buddha, I engaged in recitation constantly and diligently. Bodies echoed sonorously, the morning star brightened and entered into myself. According to Kukai's words, he had chanted this mantra a million times and at the final stage of this practice, a shining bright morning star came into his body. This may not only be a mystical experience, it may have been that the extreme concentration brought Kukai's consciousness to another state. Taiko Yamazaki, who is a practitioner and a researcher of this practice, said that this is not a hallucination, but a clarity of consciousness obtained by this Buddhistic practice. Also, this brings unity between the body, mouth, and mind, which is an important aspect for Shingon Buddhism in order to become one with the universe. I would like to encourage attention that this mystical experience of Kukai was a passive state that the morning star entered into the body. In other words, when an intellectual tension is released at a certain stage, a higher order intelligence manifests. In order to deepen the discussion, it is important to not keep this experience of accepting knowledge only within the Eastern context. I think there was a time when this type of experience was discussed in West as well. Here, I would like to invite Hannah Arendt, a well-known political philosopher. You may have a sudden impression, but in the argument about human activity, 
Hannah Arendt pointed out that the work creates artificial things and action produces web of human relationships. I believe that the appropriateness of her terminology implies that she is an important thinker in this era. According to Arendt, the way of life has been a big theme in Western history of ideas. In her book of human condition, Arendt discussed about the contrast between the two lifestyles. With a contemplativa, a contemplative life, and with a activa, an active life, Arendt states that ancient Greek philosophers insisted upon the superiority of the vita, acti, vita contemplativa, for which the vita activa merely provided necessities. She continues, thought and cognition are not the same. Thought, the source of artworks, is manifest without transforming or transfiguration in all great philosophy, whereas the chief manifestation of the cognitive processes by which we acquire and store up knowledge is the sciences. Based on the experience of Kukai and the discussion of Arendt on intellectual experience, we realize that there are two kinds of intelligence. In Buddhism, comprehensive intelligence and analytical intelligence are thought to be different things. I think that this will each correspond to Arendt's idea of thought and cognition. How can we connect these two ideas of intelligence to the discussion of AI. As a hypothetical procedure, we call the left side as accepted intelligence and the right side as cognitive intelligence. The top of Chinese character, there is a different term. The pronunciation is same, qi, but uh, there is a different meaning. The current AI discussion, for example, deep learning, does not go beyond the category of cognitive intelligence. So does the discussion of singularity. How can we update the discussion of singularity? I think this framework provides an insight to our future discussion. Let's remind again of Kukai's experience. From his experience, we can think that the transition from the intensive concentrating to the passive mystical experience means the synthesis of intelligence. Here, this transcendental existence becomes the key for this discussion. Before the modern era, we believed in the transcendental existence that is to say, God and Buddha. However, religion sometimes remained within super, superstition. It was the power of science based on cognitive intelligence that brought a paradigm shift. That is to say, and Stoibarung. When technologies acquire transcendency, and the technology itself begins to penetrate into the area that religion once played, this situation should be called a singularity. If so, it should, be, it should not be called the enchantment. It means that AI, which integrates the two types of intelligence to be sanctified,
when facing trans transcendental existence, we reaffirm ourselves. To face the Buddha means to notice the Buddha within ourselves. In Shingon Buddhism, it is called Nyojichi Jishin, to know myself as I am. This is also a standing point, starting point for Buddhistic training. At first, there is a subjective effort going down to the inner part of ourselves and moving from there to transcendental existence. After that, there is intellectual enlightenment given by transcendental existence. Kukai called the intersection of subjectivity and enlightenment Nyuga Ganyu. Buddha enters me and I enter Buddha. And made this the final point of Buddhistic training. This is exactly the experience of Kukai himself. And I think this is a point of the two intelligence merging. Finally, we have reached the theme of this lecture. To think about AI as thus under it is to know ourselves through technology. If we think about singularity as a point of technology becoming a transcendental existence for us, we should not only fear and stop but try to find a way to coexist with it. Now we find the same words of one great entrepreneur who opened the era of information technology. Needless, needless to say, it is Steve Jobs. Most important, have the courage to follow heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything is secondary. The very person who opened the era of information technology seems to understand the Nyojichi Jishin to know thyself. From him and the following trends of mindfulness gives, gives me the sense that this new age is possible. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, I'm introducing our next speaker, Mark Kuekenberg. Mark Kuekenberg is a professor of philosophy of media and technology at the Department of Philosophy, University of Vienna, and a part-time professor of technology and social responsibility at the De Montfort University, UK. Currently, he is president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology. His publications, publications include Growing Moral Relation, Human Being at Risk, Inver, um, uh, um, Environmental Skill, Money Machines, Neuromantic Cyborgs, and Using Words and Things, and numerous art articles in the era of philosophy of technology, in particular the philosophy and ethics of robots and ICT. So please welcome Mr. Mark Kalkenberg. Thanks for your... Uh, does this work? Thanks for your kind introduction. Um, so uh, let me talk about romantic cyborgs. Um, I should mention my talk is based on, uh, on this book, which is much longer than the 25 minutes, obviously. So uh, for people interested, can, can read more about this. So I'm, I'm a philosopher of technology. Um, that's quite uncommon. Many philosophers have specific areas in traditional um, fields of philosophy. I do think um, exclusively about new media, new technologies. Um, 
And uh, I'm particularly interested in robotics, AI, and, and automation. Now, um, what, I, what I did in this part of my work was to, um, in order to try to better understand my relation to technology, I um, uh, looked at romanticism and used that as a framework um, to see if this could, could help with this. Um, in a critical way, because I think we, we also need to explore how to go beyond romanticism. Also, I think uh, what, what this um, contributes to is that um, the, the, the efforts that, that me and other people do to bridge the gap um, between the humanities and technology. Uh, usually, technology is seen as very different as something technical that has nothing to do with um, what people do in the humanities, like philosophers, historians, um, uh, and, and people busy with literature. So this is, I think, a gap that needs to be bridged. And then also this work very well connects with um, a main theme here at the festival, um, which is how technology is embedded in and shaped by culture. So, and this was also uh, uh, why I wrote the, this book. Uh, and uh, also another one that came out this year about how technology is embedded um, in um, uh, language and how language can be used as a model to better understand technology. So what I will do today is to um, talk about the relation between romanticism and technology and uh, usually the, the combination um, romanticism technology is something that uh, is, is puzzling uh, because most of us assume that romanticism is against the machine uh, or romanticism is associated with relationships um, with machines. I'm not going to talk about that, um, but I'm going to talk about the tradition which started early 19th century, people like Novalis, Schelling, uh, Mary Shelley also, um, and see how, how this uh, creates a continuing line from this early romanticism uh, to our use of technology today. Um, so I looked at the history of romanticism um, in France, Germany, Britain. I won't go into detail there, um, but I, l let me go to the features that I extracted from uh, reading about romanticism. Uh, one is, of course, that romantics, they like to emphasize feeling as opposed to um, rational uh, thinking. They like to re-enchant the world because the assumption is that um, with the modern world that there is a secularization, that there is a disenchantment, and then the romantics are going to re-enchant that. Um, they also want to make the world more mysterious. They want a union between mind and matter. Um, we feel that the, the, in the modern era, there's this split and there's this fragmentation, and they want to, to unite mind and matter again. They want liberation, personal liberation, but also political liberation. Um, there are various types of um, political romanticisms there, uh, but it sometimes involves the idea of a utopia, uh, a, a better world, a uh, world that's not here, but a world that we, we can hope for, that we can try to realize. Um, and then, of course, also the, uh, the idea that we should connect again with nature. I think these features are also there today, uh, but they were certainly there um, <coughs> in the beginning of the 19th century among artists, among philosophers, among writers. And so, um, if we look at this, what the, the assumption is often that this romanticism has nothing to do with machines or is even against machines. Um, so the, the opposition is that uh, between romanticism and technology that feeling sense against objectivity, the assumption is that technology has to do with rationality, um, objectivity, orientation towards the future also. Romanticism is often accused of being backward looking, uh, conservative, whereas technology is uh, supposed to be progressive. Um, technology is related to the secular, to the non-religious, whereas romanticism is again is, is related to, to uh, religion and spirituality. Um, romantics are said to be, want an other world uh, than this one, um, 
that uh, te technology is, is, is then seen as like, don't be dreamy, um, get, get real, and so on. Um, and, and yeah, so romanticism, in, in the world of romanticism, it seems uh, there's place for spirits, ghosts, and magic, whereas um, uh, traditionally technology is seen as uh, being, being secular, being about materiality and machines. So this is based on, on the view that there is a disenchantment in the modern world, um, that there is what Max Weber called Entzauberung, uh, disenchantment. He borrowed a term and guttering from uh, Schiller and then changed it uh, for his own purposes there. So he, there is a link with the romantic tradition also. And one, one could question this assumption. One could question, like, do we... Uh, today, but also in the modern world in general, um, do we really have a disenchanted world? Um, and uh, is, 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 this, is this true? And so what I did was I went back in first to the, to the history again, the 19th century, where we find romanticism without a machine, but also romanticism with the machine. And this is something that I want to emphasize in this talk. So. If we look at the history, we could find, for example, in Novalis, the idea of a magic science. He wanted um, not uh, an, an art and a literature and a philosophy that's, that's removed from science, but he wanted the synthesis of science and art. Um, so it's also a very interesting idea for today. And then in, in Maricelli's um, fiction, there's, there is a lot of science. So if we look at... Um, the whole period then, we see that there was something like a romantic science. Um, there was, of course, um, science with all the, the modern rules we know, but it was also at the same time a kind of romantic imagination and experimentation. So the instruments the uh, people used um, were used to reveal the wonders of nature. Um, nature was mysterious. Um, and nature uh, was, was actively um, encountered. Um, so this is uh, already a practice, a scientific practice, uh, which does not stand in opposition uh, to romanticism and a scientific, scientific pra practice that's at the same time also technological, um, because the, it's very material instruments that play a role in the practice of revealing the wonders of nature. So uh, we get all kind of gothic romantic experiments, for example, the attempt to reanimate dead bodies using the force of electricity, which itself was seen as a mysterious force, uh, something, something new and mysterious. Um, similarly, sometimes nowadays, some uh, new discoveries in quantum science, for example, some people find this also very mysterious. Um, there was, in, in Shelley, as I already said, there was a combination with science, so Mary Shelley was very, um, was very uh, influenced by the science of her day and had exactly this kind of ideas also about reanimation of a corpse, uh, the, the, the monster that Frankenstein creates, uh, is exactly a kind of dream, a romantic dream, but at the same time also uh, uh, it relates to real scientific experiments of the day, of the, the romantic science of the day. Then if we go further in the 19th century, we can see this continuation of romantic thinking, but also always with a link to science um, in this case, and here in, in Jules Verne, um, you find also the, uh, the, the science fiction, and science fiction again with, with really a technological component in it, um, really very uh, detailed thinking about in, uh, how to get a rocket to the moon, for example, um, which then in turn also, uh, which was not only influenced by science, but also influenced uh, science itself. Uh, for example, uh, people develop the early pioneers of rocket science, uh, they actually read Jules Verne and they were, they were um, inspired uh, by him. And even astronauts later that, that went to the moon, uh, one of them also quotes uh, Verne. Um, later we can also see um, 
all kind of links with robotics, and that has also its origins in that 19th century where wonder and science and technology were combined. Uh, for example, the uh, stories of Hoffman, it's literature, it's fiction, but it's also related to real, uh, very material automata uh, that are, have been built. So there's a whole history of that um, already there. Um, and so one can conclude, yes, there was a romanticism against technology. Some romantics uh, wanted only to be poets, only use words, only write. But others also uh, experimented or engaged with the science of their day. And I found this very interesting because if we look at today, I think there's also a, a combination of romanticism and technology, both in those who develop technology uh, as in those, uh, like most of us, also who use technology. So let us look uh, closer at that. Again, I take here in this book, um, I normally don't, but in this book I find very helpful to use a strong historical approach. So I looked at where does this contemporary so-called digital culture come from? Well, the, it comes from, um, of course, development of personal computers and the Internet. But this itself is um, uh, an, an historical development that's connected with, for example, the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s, that is connected also with science fiction, science fiction that again influenced people um, uh, who developed technology. So I looked at um, how, how romantic values and, uh, and computing came together. Uh, one term there is hippie computing. One can also say cyber romanticism. So when it comes to the development of personal computers, the forerunners of our, all our uh, devices we have today, um, uh, we see, for example, Steve Jobs uh, as a kind of techno-romantic hero who combines, <clears throat> on the one hand, his, his hippie uh, values an interest, he, he, he used drugs, he was interested in new, uh, uh, gaining new kind of uh, consciousness um, and, and, and being a, a rebel, and fused that with, uh, on the other hand, a very uh, um, concrete material development of technologies, uh, uh, and, and then the, you have the myth of the garage where, where, where the personal computers were built. Um, and it was partly true, of course, but partly also um, was a, a romantic ideal. So that was in the, in the 80s, personal computing. And then when we move to the 90s, we also see romanticism um, where cyberspace is discovered. So now it's not dreaming going to the moon, but uh, dreaming uh, to discover uh, new spaces again, but this time the uh, space of cyberspace. Um, so there was uh, all kind of metaphors were used that show this kind of um, uh, romantic and one could also say uh, kind of um, colonial uh, endeavor to, to uh, conquer the, the new f uh, frontiers. Um, so there, in, in, in a context of the U.S., there, there is a whole language there about frontiers, cowboys uh, that, that, that is used. And, and uh, which shows, by the way, also again how culture in general and, and technology are very much um, uh, related, as I argued yesterday. So um, we have that with the internet, exploration of unknown space, exploration of new uh, frontiers, and, and then also the, the, the hacker as a romantic figure, a romantic rebel, who, um, who is no longer um, someone who is regarded as merely technical or as boring or as connected with administration bureaucracy as people thought about computing in the 50s. Uh, and so now the, 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 the hacker is, 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 is cool, uh, the nerd is cool also, um, and typical romantic uh, desires, power to the imagination, uh, change the world, become connected with um, personal computing and the internet. And so you get uh, a very powerful ID slash technology there. Um, internet becomes a liberation tool. Um, suddenly, um, if you were not good in social communication or you were not happy with some things in social communication, you could liberate yourself by entering 
a virtual world, for example, you could gain freedom from your body, which you might also not be happy with. So there's, there's a, um, a liberation uh, going on, and this was also already in romantic times, uh, people wrote and imagined to liberate themselves. Um, internet also um, could be seen um, at the time as, as yeah, maybe something that also goes from the material to the spiritual. Um, something that, that realizes this romantic dream of, of, of making what is that alive. Um, so this is also still, still interesting today, I think, to, to think about. Um, and then the political aspect is there too, the political utopia. Um, let's try to, to have a different society, but then now by technological means. So there were all kind of uh, uh, romantic dreams related and hopes also related to this new internet. The internet could maybe uh, also socially and politically liberate us. Then finally in this development you also see the metaphor of the cyborg um, where the idea is not to, to escape to a different reality or to become someone else but rather to merge with the machine. Um, so you see that in the 80s and 90s in, uh, um, in Haraway, for example, um, and you could say that this kind of um, uh, idea here is a continuation of the romantic desire for a union of matter and spirit, um, which now um, is done by um, new technological means. And then, finally, we arrive at today. So I think today this line continues. Today we're not suddenly um, totally um, thinking in secular terms. We're not totally um, disenchanted. Our technologies are not mere tools. If they're tools, they're also romantic tools. And they're used for romantic purposes. For re-enchantment, for bringing back the mystery, for liberation, and gaining this union of humans and machines. So if we look at some technologies then, uh, more concrete of today, then we can see, I think, this uh, romantic aspect, this romantic dimension um, of it. So um, cyborgs, the, the, the idea of the cyborg is still very popular, but also uh, if you look at our daily life, how much we are already connected to phones, the internet, one could very easily interpret that as a realization by technological means of uh, uh, having spirit and matter, um, mind and materiality connected. Uh, robots, also the, uh, the very idea of living with robots, uh, it seems uh, uh, also to fulfill the romantic dream that the machine and the human merges, that there's no longer opposition. Romantics always want to go beyond oppositions. And uh, so this, this harmony, her, harmony, this utopia of harmony with robots uh, fits in that. Mind uploading then uh, fits a lot with a kind of romanticism that wants to liberate um, uh, from, from the body, uh, a kind of platonic um, idea that, that the body is a prison and that we, we need to get out of that. Uh, mind uploading promises to do that. Uh, virtual reality enables us now to um, not discover cyberspace, but discover worlds we can make ourselves uh, with virtual reality. You can hear also at the conference experience um, virtual reality and there will be augmented reality also um, very soon everywhere. So this could be again seen in a romantic vein of bringing the magic back into the world. It could be used as a romantic tool. Um, you, you can have all your fantasy figures, for example, you can actually uh, insert them in, in real uh, life as it is experienced. Um, Internet of Things then uh, made me think about Alice in Wonderland, about um, also again a kind of enchanting of the world by means of smart devices. In, a way, in, in this kind of romanticism, it doesn't matter how exactly you code it, how exactly what's behind the screen, it matters the world you create of these enchanted and living things. And so very um, um, interesting. Normally you could only do that in literature. Now with new technologies you can do that. And then the talking machines is maybe the most, most magic thing of all, where, where the machine uh, gets a voice, and voice is often associated with 
being human or being a person. So once that kicks in, then that also seems to bring the, uh, the magic in. Uh, magic as trickery and as power, but also as enchantment. Now, um, I have to watch the time, but I made objections then against romanticism, I brought that in. So if it's the case that today in our use of technology um, there is there's a strong romantic dimension, then I think it's good to be critical of, romant of, of this. And to do that, we can look at traditional criticisms of romanticism, that there is a danger of self-absorption. You're only busy with yourself, with your own liberation, with your own uh, nice experiences, and maybe you forgot, forget about uh, political and social issues at the other, other end of the world, for example. Huh? Um, that's, uh, 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 some hippies, for example, um, uh, could be accused of that, and, and today the, the new kind of romanticism too. Um, romantic dialectic, what I mean by that is that um, we might think that uh, we might have these <coughs> romantic experiences, but in the meantime the big companies produce all this um, technology and extract data from it and sell the data and in a way sell sell us off to, uh, to, to other parties. So maybe this is um, a kind of self-illusion that is, that is um, good for a certain interest. So from a critical theory point of view, you can really, um, you could say that there is, um, just as there was a dialectic of the Enlightenment which turned into its opposite, there is also, as I argue in the book, a dialectic of um, romanticism which turns into its opposite and becomes everything romantics um, also don't want. Now, I think because of these problems in romanticism, and I just picked out uh, this, these uh, points here, because of these problems we could try to move beyond romanticism and deal with technology and with others and with ourselves in a non-romantic way, um, but I think this is very difficult because if we look at the language we use, we've seen in the first presentation how, how, how difficult it is. We, we, we are really um, kind of trapped in this language use and it's very difficult to, to go beyond that. Um, and um, yeah, in, in, my, in my book on that I say more, but also the technologies we use. So I think that if you look at this whole cultural development, the culture was always linked with the technologies. So if we want to get out of romanticism, I think we need a different language and we need to different writing and thinking, but we at the same time also need perhaps different technologies. Um, and that, uh, from there I went into two directions. One was to, to say like maybe we need more craft work and more direct engagement with the material um, because this, this, uh, this seems to be non-romantic, it's, it's less dreamy, um, but it's still technological. Um, or we could also think about uh, the machine, like a lot of all this thinking in modernity and, and including romanticism is always about the machine, but can we can we create non-machines or post-machines, as I wrote? Can, can we do that? What would be a post-machine? Uh, what would be um, the end of the machine? Um, if our machines get less material, if there's more nets and less uh, material objects, does that mean that we go towards more spiritual and less material? Or will there always be uh, something material? What's really the future of the machine? So I think this also comes out of this discussion and I'm curious to, to see what you think of this. Um, so to conclude, I think, um, of course, we can use all kind of theories to understand technology and discuss uh, technology, new technologies that do things with our lives. Um, I have used in, in this particular book, Romanticism, to, um, to do an, an interpretation of, of what, what is going on today. And I think it, for me it was very useful to, to do that because uh, I, I got new meanings out of that. Um, I think there is this problem that it's very difficult to think in a non-romantic way. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe this more um, Ars Electronica as a kind of art and craft and a practice as also many artists here um, um, practice it. Maybe, maybe this can be 
um, one way to, to get out of the romantic um, dealings with technology, but there's always the danger to, um, uh, yeah, to revert back. So that was the, the, the problem I um, arrived at at the end um, of, of the book, and I'm, I'm curious to see what you think. Okay, I'm, uh, we are going to continue, so uh, I'm welcoming uh, our next uh, presenter, speaker. Um, Mr. Mantia Diawara uh, is going to talk about culture and politics in the age of IA. And um, as it should be, I have to, write, uh, to read uh, a short bio. Please, uh, come on, on the stage. Mantia Diawara was born in Mali, West Africa. He is a distinguished professor of comparative literature and film at New York University. Diawara was educated in Guinea, Konerki, Bamako, Mali, and Paris, France, before immigrating in the United States to pursue his studies. studies. Mantia Diawara is a prolific writer and filmmaker. His essays and opinion in French and English on art cinema and politi politics have appeared in the, the New Times magazine, LA Times, Liberation, Media Part, and Art Forum. Please welcome Mr. Diawara. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, if I become schizophrenic, please forgive me, you know, because I just came through New York. Uh, Amsterdam and here, so there is some kind of jet lag, uh, but this is an exciting topic and uh, I couldn't uh, pass it. Uh, I'm going to start this uh, by bringing the subjective in art and hopefully in, sci in the sciences too. Uh, I begin at as the introduction, the generous introduction just revealed, I, I am from Mali, West Africa, and I grew up with the African independence movements in the 60s. And we were basically told that if only we espouse, we were to accept uh, modernity, uh, we will easily catch up with the West, and we will be equal with the West. In fact, there are very famous statements by some of the poets that we followed, uh, uh, poets like uh, M. Césaire, uh, who basically said that you have to master the uh, language of the master in order to become uncolonizable by the master. So we really believe in modernity in that sense. They were some of the major thinkers. And so, personally, I came from Mali, went to France, studied, and then with this uh, ideology, this kind of thinking in, my, in mind, you know, some of the people being Franz Fanon, uh, Richard Wright, these were our master thinkers. So I espoused this the ideology, I really believed in it. I went to France, studied, and then uh, came to the U.S., had my Ph.D., and became a professor. And I am relatively speaking a successful person because I'm autonomous. I can take care of myself, uh, I can help my students, I can do things for people here and there. But when you look at it from the perspective of my village, where my parents are from in Mali, but I would even go as far as to say in all of Mali, uh, yes, there may be some, some who are envious of me because I'm in America, but on the whole, I'm a failure. So this is really, this is what is leading me to the artificial thinking. Uh, I'm a failure, why? Because in my area, and I think uh, in many places in Africa, and probably in other places where they have communities, in smaller places like uh, uh, Austria here, in other places where they have communities, success is measured in a different way. Uh, 
Where the success for me was to become an individual, an autonomous person, to uh, work hard in school, and they said, in order to make it as an academic, you have to publish papers, you have to be visible, you have to do all these things that we do in the U.S., keep running, 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 and you are successful. In the village, to be successful, you have to be able to solve a problem. You have to be able to solve a problem, and what is the problem? The problem could be, for example, if there is an epidemic. So a successful person could come and take care of it. Or if there are two villages at war, a successful person could potentially come and stop the war from taking place. Uh, or if there is drought, which we have uh, all the time in uh, West Africa, which is actually the reason for a lot of uh, immigration today, because you know the land is uh, being destroyed and uh, the trees are died, uh, have died, and uh, the rivers are dried up, and so on. A successful person used to be able to find solution to these things in my area, so that. If you look at uh, the music, uh, one of the things that Mali is very strong in is music. So even though you, don't, if you, you never heard of Mali, you would have heard of uh, Ali Farka Toure, Salif Keita, Umu Sangare, and so on. So culturally, very powerful in music. And in the music, actually, if you take the roots of Malian music, it's all about, they all praise songs about I don't know if the word is enablers or heroes. Hero is too strong, but problem solvers. All the Malian songs are about a person who solves some problem. You know, and and I, in fact, I used to always, uh, uh, when I was uh, editing my last uh, film for this documentary, I, I was editing, always listening to a, a f my mother's favorite song. And this f song, I had completely misinterpreted the meaning all along. I had completely misinterpreted the meaning. Because the song goes like this. If you uh, lean on a tree and the tree dies, what are you going to do? If you lean on, the, uh, on a person and the person dies, what are you going to do? If you lean on a river and the river dries up, what are you going to do? And then the song says, lean on the person who's your big love and your big friend. Now, this song is it, from the 60s, but it has been, uh, the meaning has changed a lot. For example, they'll take the meaning, lean on God. God is the one who can help you. They, they will say, lean on this. So the, the signification has changed. For me, it was always a love song. And then uh, I was editing my film in Greece, and I started listening to the, and I'm working with immigrants you know, people from Lesbos and different places. And suddenly, I realized that the song was actually also about the drought. Because in my area, people have been going through the drought all the time. You know, since the sixth century, the Ghana Empire. But of course, the uh, whole idea of Anthropocene now has made it diff uh, worse. Because now, uh, the land has been destroyed. Uh, it, it, farming is no longer viable, and, every, and politics are bad. Uh, so all Malians, all Nigerians, Nigerians, Senegalese, they are all leaving. But this was happening for a long time, and the song therefore is saying, it cannot lean on the tree because it, it, it's almost saying that you are lazy. You know, get up and go to immigration and bring money back. So, I'm suddenly beginning to find another meaning for this song. Now, why do I begin with this subjective story? Because uh, I'm at a moment, you know, I'm past 60 years old, and uh, I'm really beginning to wonder what happened to me. You know, I believe in this narrative by Franz Fanon, this narrative uh, by Sekuture, all the heroes that I'm not going to bother you with because they, they, they're my African heroes. But actually, in the village, that's not too far. When I go to Bamako, I go to the village, uh, they say, well, what do you do? And then they try to see me like they used to see my uncle or uh, my mom, too, was a big problem solver. They would see me like that, but yet I can't solve anybody's problem because I take this distance. A modern man takes distance and looks at 
things from afar in order to say, yeah, I can see what your problem is, but I can look at it this way too. So I've become very reflexive. I, I can't really solve a problem. I can't decide for anybody anymore. That has become my main education, you know. Until uh, recently, when I began to question myself on this, and why did I do that? Uh, there is a philosopher who, who passed away four years ago. His name is uh, uh, Edouard Glisson. I think some of you may have heard about uh, Edouard Glissant. I made a film on Edouard Glissant, and Edouard Glissant is known for you know, maybe five key concepts. Uh, one is the creolization, that is all our societies are creolized. You know, there is no such thing as rooted identity. Identities are always mixed all the time. And then he is also known for, uh, and he and Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze, they were good friends, but they both are at work on, uh, on this concept a lot. The whole idea of relation. Poet, he, he wrote a book called Poetics of Relation. And for him, uh, we have to go away from the ident rooted identity to uh, relational identity. Uh, identity as this is my roots and my authenticity, my country, to identity as you know, entering in contact with people. And in entering in contact with people, you create a new identity. And this is, when you think about it, it's quite important because, at least in the U.S., we were dominated by identity politics throughout the whole 70s, 80s, and 90s, so that you have this famous concept now called politically correct. It's really deployed against identity politics. So, Glissant, in his critique, he's both critiquing Europe, but also Africans who always want to hold on to their identity. And Glissant, I mean, if you speak French, his, his concept is very simple. He says, je peux changer en échangeant avec l'autre, ça me perdre ni me dénaturer. So, literally, it means I can change through my transaction or my exchange with the other without destroying myself. Because for Glissant, his main, his main thesis was that people don't want to relate to other people because they are afraid of losing their identity. You know, but listen, say, no, nothing is gonna, the essential aspect of your identity is gonna be there, don't worry, but you can learn more from the spirituality of the other person. You can learn more from whatever the culture of that other person is, so you can change through that, but your identity is, it's, it's your identity. You just get more and more of them, but nothing is going to happen to it. So the politics of uh, poetics of relation is about that. And Glissa is also known for what he called the archipelagic thinking, thinking of the archipelago, because he's from Martinique. And he opposes this thinking to continental thinking. He, his whole problem is that continental thinking is uh, fixed thinking. You know, our civilization against the civilization, or people, we have civilization, other people don't have civilization. So, Atlantic studies, uh, continental thinking really is closed in many ways. Africa is closed, Europe is closed, America is closed. Whereas the Caribbeans, they are always suffering through the, the weather. Well, right this moment, we have serious problems of the weather. So, they're open to all this people coming, the weather coming, tremblement, and so on. So therefore, the archipelagic thinking, when the world began to reach a certain point, is the archipelagic thinking that will help us to actually find a way out. Because they have always been uh, you know, uh, subject to transformation, to openness, and they are always open. And this is another key, key thing, uh, aspect of uh, Glissant's work. And then, he has the concept of opacity. Opacity by opacity, literally, he basically is opposing opacity to transparency. And this, is, this brings us to the theme of artificial thinking because uh, transparency depends a lot on systems, systematicity. 
you know, I understand this, I understand this, and this goes after that, and so on. It is very systematic and it's very transparent. And Gleason is very worried about transparency because every time you think you understand everything is clear to you, you are actually uh, discarding all the things that you do not understand or you do not see because Gleason believes in the, in, in the power of the invisible things that we do not see. But now, science is really pushing us to forget about all of that. Uh, witchcraft is no longer has space. Uh, superstition no longer has space. Uh, to say, in Africa, for example, people, not just Africa, the, the, the Indians in America, but I'm sure people in this country at some point, they could hear the language of the wind. They could hear the language of the mountains. They could hear the language of the rivers. But we completely got rid of all of that because we want a transparent life. Even the UN works with transparency because they basically assume that if they don't understand, then there is no point uh, in working to, we cannot communicate with each other if it's not based on transparency. And Gleason said, no, actually we communicate through opacity. Every time some, you relate to somebody, you understand some things, you don't understand other things. You don't need to understand everything that a, a person is saying to you. Uh, you. You don't need to master everything. You don't need to create some kind of system in it. Because if you do that, you end up basically with what Gleason calls le prise unique. Prise unique, French people refer to prise unique. You know, you go to a store where everything has the same price. You know, at, at, at dime, dime stores, we say in the US. You know, everything for 10 cents. So you end up with a prise unique because you want transparency. Uh, and I think it's not just Gleason, but most French uh, post-structuralists were worried about this, including uh, uh, people like Baudrillard uh, uh, talk a lot about, you know, uh, the similar crumb and so on. So, so this was very, very important to, to Gleason as well. Now, what, what do I take, when you ask me to come and talk about ethic here in a place like this, and uh, artificial knowledge, I think the key, f key for me is that first of all, as an African living in the United States, I don't want you to, to even think remotely that I don't like science, I believe in science. I don't think I can function, you know, I'm not like Donald Trump. So I believe in science completely. I don't think I can function without science, you know. But I try to, to see what science has done to people. As we are understanding the world scientifically, what are we doing to the rest of the world? This is what is important to me. And finally, the final concept of Gleason is la pensée du tremblement. And this is really what is missing in artificial knowledge. Tremblement basically means, literally means uh, 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 trembling. It means tremulous. It means quakeful, you know. But what he means is that we have to be, become tentative in our decision making. Any decision that you make, it can it can just always be certain. Certainty is a big problem for 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 uh, Edouard Glissant. You have to be tentative with your thinking. You have to tremble with the trembling of the other people. You know there are people trembling around the world. You have to be able to tremble with them. And uh, what I invite uh, a young. Uh, artificial scientists is to see if they could put that kind of subjectivity, if they could put first-person narrative that I have just been doing here, how do you put first-person narrative? That's the beginning of the ethic. How do you put that in the artificial knowledge? Where is the place for you to tremble with the other person? Or the trembling of the other person, the trembling of the world? You know, when somebody like Gleason said that, your most private thought, your most private intuition. You think you have a private intuition that no one knows. Gleason said that same intuition is being felt. 
at the same time by somebody in Japan, by somebody in the Amazon, by somebody in Africa. So what we need is to actually have a solidarity between these intuitions. How do we create some kind of solidarity between our intuitions? And this is, for me, the challenge, really, the real challenge for artificial knowledge. You know, when I, when I go to, uh, when I see art, yes, I'm, I'm, I thought I have two minutes, but I think I have made the main point. When I see art today, you know, my last film, the biggest challenge for me, because it's all archival film that I did for this year's documentary, it's all archival, and I took all of them from different places. But how do I edit them together with emotion, with subjectivity, with point of view? I mean, it's easy in, in, for filmmakers, but uh, for installations, for artificial knowledge, uh, it's a big challenge. Because you, know, you have a huge weapon here, but how do you put some subjectivity in it? This is really the, the question I'm posing, and I, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, now is the time for questions and answers, and um, I would like to invite all of uh, the speakers to join me here on the podium. Um, and I am encouraging uh, you to raise uh, your hands and uh, pose a question. You have a unique opportunity, and also since uh, we've heard uh, so different approaches to the topic, you know, I am also encouraging debate among you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, first chance to the audience. Yes, please. Uh, can we have a microphone over there? Um, very short question for um, Senbo Hidaka-san. Um, consciousness. Um, we mostly have, we use the word artificial intelligence. Uh, very, very seldom the, the word artificial consciousness. And consciousness is a term which in spiritual traditions is a very, very, very important um, term and concept. Can you tell us something more about that? Can you tell us some more about, about consciousness? I mean, artificial, I mean, relating artificial intelligence with consciousness. Consciousness. <laughs> え、あの、仏教の方でま、先ほどのプレゼンテーションで少し触れさせていただいたんですけども、ま、仏教においてはその意識というかあの内面性を非常に深くあの自分で、あの、認識するってことがすごく大事になってくるんですね。ですから、今
表面的なものではなくて非常に内面性が非常に構造化されてるあの如実地自身っていう仏教の言葉を挙げましたけども本当の自分を知るっていうのは単に自分がどんな人を知るというだけのことの意味では本当はなくてその自分の精神の内面性みたいな非常に深くあの構造化されたところまで入っていくっていうのが仏教の修行の中でますその中に意識自体に深いレイヤーがいくつもあるっていうものが仏教的な修行の中で言われていることでそういった、まあ、東洋の,あの仏教の、えー、経験みたいなものが、えー、哲学やサイエンスとどう手を取り,と取り合ってアーティフィシャルインテリジェンスの開発につなげていくかっていうのが非常に大事ではないかというふうに考えています。Um, so, as I said,、uh, it's very important that、uh, consciousness、uh, is taken as a set with the、uh, experience of、uh, digging into your inner self amongst、uh, Buddhism. So,、um, but among Buddhism, it is very important to understand that this、uh, consciousness is divided into certain layers. So, it's not just about understanding your strengths, your weaknesses, but it's about understanding these, all these layers that are hidden under these consciousnesses. So, that's the reason why he thinks it's very important to have this spirituality to be in hand in hand with science、um, and、uh, philosophy. And this empirical、uh, way of understanding、uh, consciousness to be in combination in order to discover the new、uh, realms of artificial intelligence itself. Hi, I don't, I don't know if you want me to weigh in on this at all, but I just want to compare,、uh, I, not to disagree at all. But to、uh, relate this to the talk I gave when I talked about the implicit bias versus the explicit bias. So, one definition of con conscious is what you have explicit awareness of.、Um, and then you might say that I was calling for a conscious AI, which you might think is crazy. But on the other hand, in this very boring definition that I just gave, you could say we already have something sort of like that. And here's the example. Uh, prediction, text prediction. So, in this case, the implicit memory is the entire dictionary. It's all the words you might say. But in practice, there are certain bad words that we, the, the text predictor will not say, will not guess that you're typing. Even if you clearly are typing that word, it's not going to finish it for you. So, that's a different list, a short list that's been put in that is、uh, to make you align better to society. So, I realize that is not all the full richness of, of human consciousness, but that's my point. My point is that part of this is about compartmentalization. And if when you talk about consciousness, you talk about, you know, why do we have explicit memory?、Uh, do rats have explicit memory? Yes, they do.、Uh, how does science approach that? That's one question. If you mean by conscious, you know, like a human,、uh, well, then that's a totally different. So, so the one word has many meanings. Anybody? Yes. I'm not.、Uh, Still, yeah. I'm not sure I can formulate it right now in the right way. That's why I was holding back. But it was based on the understanding that an AI, in some form, needs to learn and train. And quite often, we see that as a reward system or. What you called, on the other hand, suffering. So, knowing how to suffer and how to work. There's some ethic around that. So, an AI in the future might have to suffer. And on the other hand, it might have a pleasure system as well. And I'm just interested across the panel how they think about the ethics of that. We can go far deeper than that, but I just would like to be there. I, I actually would much rather hear the last. Uh, three speakers, particularly um, the, the,、um, the final speaker talking about、uh, artificial thought, where he would put that. But just to clarify what I was claiming, again, in this very reductive sense, if you can say pleasure is what you're rewarded for, then all machine learning already has that. The question about suffering is、um, can you make it so systemic that you could actually? Uh, punish a machine for doing something bad like going into debt, you know, spending money it doesn't have. 
And that was what I said you couldn't do without this mind uploading, which I agree with Mark might be sort of mythic. <laughs> but even if it is possible, um, then you would create something that was so human-like that it may not be ethical to own it. So, but would you like to uh, take? Yeah. What? I, I agree with, with Joanna that it's kind of unethical to create uh, a being that can suffer. Um, it's, it, it, it's not, um, I think with humans it's very different matter. We don't, we don't control that so much, but... Uh, I don't know. If this, is this virtual? Uh, the, the, the opposite of suffering is satisfaction. And you might have a system that only seeks ultimate satisfaction in some form an orgasm wherever that stimulation comes why, from why would you want to create such systems at all <laughs> well what well, is part of learning process in a, in a trivial way uh, you know the the you know the the thermostat when it gets hot and it turns it on you know like that's the only thing it knows so it's entirely realized its existence right um but that's kind of trivial, and, and I know it's trivial. And so I think that's the flip side. If you agree that it's unethical to have suffering, then it's sort of unethical to have you know, such systemic pleasure as well, because then the removal of that would be suffering, right? So <laughs> I don't. No? Very wise. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, in the. In the in the 80s, uh, all the way through 90s, uh, we used to have uh, what Roland Barthes called the pleasure of the text. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with that. And in many ways, this you know, uh, jouissance, what do you call orgasm and so on. You know, he, he addressed this. The, the the difference with that and what you saying here in opposing. Uh, pleasure to suffering, uh, the difference is that that pleasure had all kind of subjectivity in it, or consciousness that we just heard here, had all kind of subjectivity in it, had its ethic all, already in it. Whereas the final, I, I was not here for your talk, but the final, the end project, and this is why I think you're calling for suffering, the end project of uh, AI is basically uh, this pleasure that does not emancipate, whereas the suffering helps it to helps us to, to what I was calling through uh, Edward Gleason to tremble with the trembling with other people uh, instead of trembling with AI in some ways. So at least that's the way I'm trying to understand this. But you know, just to just to clarify for anybody else also who has uh, missed my talk. I was not calling for suffering. I was actually calling to uh, maintain uh, human dignity and to not try to create the AI. I, and I, the suffering was one of the distinctions. Yeah. So, we'll pass it. Yes? Yes? Another person? Yes, I'm sorry, another question. Um, not specifically to one of you, but <laughs> whoever wants to answer. Um, could speculatively thinking uh, AI stir us or help us find something like a shared consciousness? You want? Or maybe he wants to go. Just try first then. Okay, can... yeah, I mean, it, it, again, uh, if you look at uh, what is happening in the US by with what they are calling now Afrofuturism. Uh, you know, uh, what they're looking at science fiction as a way out of the system now in the US. And this is very popular now, and I'm, I'm sure that's why you say speculative thinking, you're familiar with this. In that sense, yes, there is at least a community of people who are thinking about getting out of neoliberalism through speculative thinking. Yes, uh, yeah, I could drop some names, uh, but you know, even artists like Jana Kanfra, uh, you know, uh, Octavia Butler, the science fiction writer, and so on. So yes, there is a community, and it's really what people are doing today. Uh, uh, 
taking, again, like we do with consciousness, a completely different definition than the one you just used, um, artificial intelligence is a form of perception. And one of the things about algorithmic perception is that it can be shared uh, across a large number of people very quickly. And so to some extent, then the minds become entrained. And that is not a definition of consciousness I usually use, but I have, again, heard neuroscientists talk about that in the context of split brain patients, right? So as the two hemispheres learn to be able to cooperate again, they become more entrained. I think that's fascinating. Maybe that is part of what happens when we get into a crowd mentality. So in that sense, yes, it, it could, for better or worse, uh, help us with our groupthink and our, and our, uh, our shared, our shared uh, sense of, uh. Well, I think, one of, again, one of the important ways that we have been successful as uh, gathering so much intelligence as we have is because we're all individual and we all have slightly different perspectives. It doesn't make sense to have a whole lot of the same machines doing the same computation over the same data. So it is, it's important. I think, uh, I don't know, I, I was inspired when I learned about the immune system. We, our immune system is based on a relatively small number of molecules, but we each have our own uh, hand and uh, that we're dealt, and it's different from our parents, you know, so that we were more likely not to catch diseases right directly from our immediate family. And I think when I came to understand how that worked, I started to see how that helped uh, us as societies. When we want to create our own identity, we help everybody understand more, if that makes sense. So, so yeah, AI could be good or bad that way. <laughs> Do you want to? Yeah, just quickly, um, in, in the 60s, McLuhan already taught that, that, you know, with the media of his time, we're already moving towards a, a shared consciousness, a collective consciousness. We, um, with the new technologies today, I think we're, we're, we're also definitely in that direction. Uh, the question is then, does it, is it just um, going to be a, a kind of fant a collective fantasy or is it really going to change things in the world? And that's something I'm concerned with. I, I maybe want to spin the question a bit because I feel like, you know, somehow merging with an AI or having a collective conscience and so this all is very futuristic. What I'm more concerned with is how we treat technology in society. Not so much that we're merging, but more that how we rely on them, how we trust them. So with AI systems, and we're already calling it intelligence, we just assume that they're intelligent. We don't really question what they're doing, how they're functioning, if they're better at something than we are. And I think that's the critical point. I think it's not so much about how, if you're merging and if we can understand each other, and if, we, if AI has a conscience, it's more about what does it to us? Do we trust our intuitions or do we rely on AI? And I think that's, that's what's changing. ちょっとその今の質問の前にその意識ってこと自体がまあちょっといろんなレイヤーの話になってるなっていう印象があったんですねでまあその私のプレゼンテーションであったのはその AI を考えることとまあかつての宗教的な超越者を考えるってことが実はつながっていて私たちの仏教においてはその超越的な存在に向かうことで我々自身を再認識するっていうプロセスがあるっていうことを申し上げたんですねそれがこの AI を考えるときに改めて人間が何であるかっていうことを問い直すことであるっていうことが今回のまあ打算大一匹のまあテーマではないかっていうのをまず理解しています。でまずそこの段階がまあファーストステップでその次の段階としてじゃあそもそも AI 自身が自分を認識するのかっていう問いだと思うんですけどもまあそもそもその自分を認識するってことがどういう事態であるかってことがきちんと共通認識化されてないと非常に議論がそれぞれが思っている意識っていう定義によってちょっと議論がしてしまっているのでちょっとあの議論の足場がちょっと私自身がちょっとつかみきれてないんですけどもまあ少なくとも AI っていうものがある種の意識を持つっていうのは多分 AI における自由の問題と関わってくるわけですね私たちの意識っていうのは私たちが自由であるってこととまあ離れていない課題だと思いますそれはいろんな今回の専門家の方が議論しているのでそれは AI とは何かっていう単なる哲学的な問題だけじゃなくてそれは社会政策的な要は AI をどうデッサンしなきゃいけないかとかまあいろんな側面であのなんていうか規定しなきゃいけない問題でもあるのかなつまり単なる哲学的問題ではなくて要は AI 開発の実務的というか実践上の課題でもあるのではないかというふうに考えています
Um, so he's a big, uh, he said, oh, okay, I'll talk I as in him, I. Um, so uh, I think at the moment we're having different layers on talking about consciousness to begin with. Um, but from his perspective, um, he wants to claim that uh, it's very important to think about uh, the religious people back in the days and AI at the current state. And for him, uh, in Buddhism, it is very important that uh, to think about these transcendental existences from yourself is exactly what, uh, exactly a question about questioning what I am. So this is kind of something that is related between technology and uh, these transcendental beings. And by questioning their existence, it's uh, actually about a question of who you yourself am, who I myself am. And that is why this conference theme, Das Andere Ich, the other I, it itself is super important to question in today. And as a next point, uh, it is important to question ourselves, does AI actually uh, cognify itself? And to uh, understand or be conscious about yourself, um, that is the actual more, more important question. And um, even for ourselves, we uh, perceive the world very much differently. So what would be an individual, what, it, what, what would, it, would it mean uh, for each individual AI to understand uh, uh, individually about its own existence? Um, here we're talking based on uh, the discussion between consciousness and freedom, and the freedom to actually uh, define who we are and what we are. And as we have been discussing with all these different experts, um, this is not only about a philosophical discussion of our existence, but it's much more of a practical, uh, pragmatic discussion on how we actually design about this understanding of uh, understanding yourself and society in a more uh, socio-political and socio-policy way. And it's very important in how we allow ourselves to design AI and ourselves and how we understand ourselves through very different layers of discussion. That, that's wonderful. Um, and it reminds me of one of my other fears of AI. One concern is that we will learn so well to predict what we can do using the machine. Um, because as you say, many people are having the same thought at the same time, but it feels unique. If we ourselves can predict what we're going to do, that is going to fundamentally alter our experience. Um, and I think it's a big challenge for the humanities in general, including religion, to help people come to terms with this totally different concept, self-concept. Hello, thank you that I could pose a question. Um, during the different talks of yours, um, a kind of old concept uh, came across by Condillac. Uh, may, if you know this, this is a philosophical experiment on a statue. And the uh, writer Condillac gives him in any of his chapters a new sensor, sensory from human being. He's starting with the nose, goes out over to seeing. I, I don't really sure what came first and then, but uh, it reminded me very of the discussion on, on AI at the moment, that, that we are giving like a machine learning some data. I would put this in the same thing with the sensory by by the by Condillac, and and I would like to ask: Is this still the same discussion like Condillac we are having nowadays? Like he proposed, I need to, yeah, like two or three hundred years ago. Is it just the the AI a new kind of medium, or let's say a higher um, developed technology? But but bottom line, is it still the same question? how we function and how we function on ourselves. I tried to answer the question in the way I think I understood it. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, I think the question is like, is AI 
fundamentally different or something new or is it just another technology? Is it like something that we had we, you know, when we invented uh, the press or cars? Is it just another thing, another tool that we are using in society? Or is it something that has some you know, new flavor to it, right? Is it you know, something that could be compared? Is, is that the question? I think more my, or more my question got into the direction of um, is it just a new technology? Is it not just something new in general? I think it's because so much technology is involved, yeah. we are think we are at a new point, but, but my feeling is more like we are talking about the same topic on a different technological level. Yeah, uh, uh, to a certain extent I agree, um, because you know, it's, it's not like something inherently different, but what AI and um, smart robotics do is they are not just mere tools anymore. So if I, if I use a tool to build something, right, it's something that I use, I know what I'm doing with, with it, I know what it's designed for, it does exactly what I want it to do, and I can stop using it and it will actually fulfill the purpose that it was designed to do. With machine learning and smart robotics, they can start to behave in unpredicted ways. They can start new behaviors, learn new patterns that I haven't envisioned yet. So they, I'm not saying that they're, you know, comparable to humans, but they are more independent and more autonomous than traditional tools that we invented. And this poses questions um, for the legal system, like in terms of liability, for example. If I have, for example, a robot that acts on its own, is doing stuff that I did not intend to do, am I still liable? Like, because I built that thing, even though I did not intend it to do that? Or is, the ro is it the robot's fault? Or is it someone else's fault? Like, like the, the question of liability, who should be responsible, that's blurring, because we somehow have a third entity that does something that we did not envision it to do, could be. And I think that's what's new. This is part of the reason for my recommendation. Uh, I, I actually worry, because if you have a bad screwdriver, it doesn't do what you expect it to do either. And so I, I think it's really important that we keep people who are building AI responsible for those things they build and that we do, that's part of the point of regulation and, and, uh, and of uh, being able to audit. So um, I, I think sometimes people try to obscure, uh, you know, maybe that's why certain car manufacturers like to say, oh, this is like a big threat. They try to obscure the fact that they have responsibility because it is more difficult, of course. It's a complicated technology, but in some ways it can be better. It'll solve the, some of the problems that you said it. So uh, I, don't, I don't actually like that. On the other hand, I do feel like sometimes, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the shift to being able to predict our own behavior is like the Copernican shift or the Darwinian shift. And it may be rejected, like Darwin is still being rejected. Okay, the last, yeah, the last question because yeah. um, I would just like to add a question to the previous Q&A we had before to the legal uh, system of AI, uh, of AI. Um, to the, if you want to know the detail why you, for example, didn't get the job uh, because of an AI system. I think it's complicated because if you take today's technology, rediscovered technology of deep uh, learning and deep neural networks, uh, the networks often abstract the data in a way which is inconceivable for humans. So even if you have uh, perfect, unbiased data, if anything like this exists, um, you might not, you cannot know uh, for which detail you've been chosen for the job or not. Uh, what solutions would you suggest or how would you cope with that problem? Thank you. The, again, uh, we, there's a difference between transparency and just like open source. So we don't, know, we won't, we don't understand every weight in a deep learning set network. We also don't understand every molecule in a brain, but we hold people responsible. And so similarly with a deep learning system, we can see whether if you just change the name from a um, European name to an African name, whether suddenly you don't get the job. 
So, so even without understanding all these details, that doesn't mean that we can't uh, have a notion of responsibility and audit auditability. Um, with regard to explanation, as, as it seems now, there are two main barriers why people are hesitant to explain algorithmic decision making. So there are two reasons, either because you can't or because you don't want to. That because I can't, as what Joanna said, it's just it's, it's opaque, and as you said, there might not be a real chance to understand the causality between those things, right? The other thing is because you don't want to, because companies are very hesitant to disclose their code because they are um, protected by trade secrets, they are proprietary nature. There's a different reason not to give explanations. But regardless of what those things are, whether it is because the technology doesn't allow it or because companies don't want it to do, we need to ask the question, where do we deploy those things now? If you have to deal with the fact that you are not going to get an explanation because you can't or you don't want to, where do we deploy those systems? Is it okay if I use um, proprietary algorithms or unexplainable algorithms to decide if you have to go to prison? Right? We would never do that in a normal setting. So if you imagine a court case, for example, right? And the judge, you know, invites a witness to testify. And the witness says, yeah, I saw that person breaking into that coffee shop. And so, yeah, when that, did that happen? And the witness says, I can tell you that. I don't want to. Would you believe that witness? Or would you question the reliability of that system? We don't do the same thing with algorithms. We just kind of assume that they are correct, that they're, they're doing the right thing, that they are trustworthy. And that's the problem. I'm not saying you need to explain and understand all algorithms in total, in all sectors, but there are certain areas where we actually have to question, is it okay, is it ethical okay that we deploy those systems where algorithms making decisions about us that deeply affect us? Okay, dear, dear lecturers and dear visitors, this is our end uh, because we went <laughs> even over uh, the slot uh, it was meant for us. Uh, um, I'm uh, super uh, um, um, happy to, uh, that I heard so many inspiring uh, uh, perspectives on uh, IA. Um, it, it opened much more questions that answer uh, 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 our, um, my doubts. You know? But I think that these events are exactly to do that. You know? So I hope you share my opinion. Please uh, welcome and, and with a warm applause our speakers. I thought they deserve it. <laughs>